Good morning. My name is Professor Kim Economides, Dean of Flinders Law School, Flinders University, and I will be the MC for this panel and presentation event this morning. I wish to welcome ladies and gentlemen, uh, predominantly from the public sector, mayors and CEOs from local government, the IPAA, professional members and partners, Senior Management Council of the State of South Australia, Price Waterhouse, Flinders University, Woolman's Lawyers, Technology One, and IPAA supporters. I would like to thank you all for attending today's seminar, especially our impressive and distinguished group of presenters, including the keynote speaker, uh, the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, who only commenced in his role a few weeks ago. His staff and the staff in the Office for Public Integrity who have assisted in making today's event possible. We thank the Honourable John Rao, MP, Deputy Premier, Attorney General, Minister for Planning, Minister for Industrial Relations, and Minister for Business Services and Consumers, who will be officially opening the event. And I would like to acknowledge IPAA's commitment to present you with events and forums that address the most up-to-date topics, issues, ideas, legislation, and challenges. Now, before we begin, just a, if I may, a few housekeeping items. We ask that you place your mobile phones on silent, as there will be a break this morning for those of you eager to take calls and check email. There are toilets in the building, uh, just follow the signs. And if there is an emergency we need to evacuate, please follow the staff as they lead you outside. We would appreciate it if you don't leave when people are presenting or during the panel discussion. If you need to leave, please exit between activities. Uh, also, we will not be letting uh, anyone in as people are presenting. So we have a, a long session ahead of us. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce um, uh, the Attorney General, the Honourable John Rao. Um, as I've just mentioned, uh, John Rao is Deputy Premier, Attorney General, Minister for Planning, Minister for Industrial Relations, and the Minister for Business Services and Consumers. After completing his law degree, John worked at law firms um, Duncan and & Hannon, and later at Johnston Withers & Associates, where he was made a partner. He was an advisor to the Hawke government from 1985 to 1988, and has been a barrister since 1997. In 2002, he was elected to the South Australian House of Assembly as the member for Enfield, where he served on various parliamentary committees until being appointed to the ministry in March 2010. John is a former member of the ALP National Executive, and he was appointed Deputy Premier in February 2011. I'm told uh, that John is a keen gardener, a cook, and an avid uh, reader of non-fiction. Uh, John, can I invite you uh, to um, open the proceedings? Thank you very much uh, uh, for having me here today. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge what a distinguished group of people we have here today, and in particular, of course, um, uh, the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, the Honourable Bruce Lander, uh, also uh, Deputy Commissioner Stevens, uh, Police Ombudsman Sarah Bolt, uh, Irma Ranieri, who is uh, driving change within the state government and doing an excellent job of it. Uh, the Ombudsman, uh, Richard Bingham. Uh, local government dignitaries, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real privilege, as I said, to be given the opportunity of speaking to all of the people in this room, many of you from the public sector, uh, who uh, are obviously interested in the important topic of uh, the independent uh, commission uh, against corruption. Uh, it is also very important, I think, that we have the great privilege of having uh, uh, Bruce Lander being able to speak to you later today. I think it's very important that all of you come to understand the way the Commissioner views his role and come to understand that he will bring a very level-headed, calm and unthreatening uh, approach to discharging that very important duty. Uh, he has in fact been in the role since the 2nd of September and uh, 
has been quietly working away uh, at the job, and I'm sure he will tell you more about um, his perspectives on those things. Can I say from my point of view, uh, it has been a priority for the government to promote transparency and to enhance the integrity of our legal and public administration systems. But this has not always been an easy thing to achieve. Uh, the important function that the ICAC uh, is now fulfilling uh, took three years to achieve uh, and uh, it was quite, a, quite an interesting journey for me. Uh, the Act eventually passed through the uh, Parliament on the 28th of November last year uh, after a rather protracted battle between um, the lower house and the Legislative Council. Anyway, that's all history now, it's happily resolved and uh, we're up and running. Uh, our ICAC is a very different model from that that exists in other states and this was very much a conscious and deliberate decision. I wanted to make sure that we had a body that would be able to produce effective prosecutions of corrupt individuals, not to be some sort of media circus or publicly funded reality TV show. The request from some sectors of the community for ICAC's operations to be open to the public scrutiny at all stages uh, of the inquiry demonstrates to me a complete lack of understanding on the part of those people about what the Office of Public Integrity and ICAC are there to do. ICAC is not a court, nor is it a prosecutorial body. It is an investigative body and investigations quite reasonably uh, should be conducted uh, in a way that is discreet. Uh, I ask you to consider if um, SAPOL, for example, had to conduct every investigation that it undertakes uh, with TV cameras and um, radio reporters and everyone else sitting in interview rooms. I mean, it just demonstrates the, the manifest stupidity of that com concept. Um, as I'm sure uh, Commissioner Lander will explain in his address, uh, this is something which is a fundamental element of, of the, the whole concept and it's something that um, I believe um, uh, he has firm views about as well. Um, the educational role uh, of the Commission is also very important. It was something that was seen to be an important element of it and again I'm sure you'll hear more about this today but the, the Commission is not there just to investigate matters. It is also there to provide a proactive educational function to uh, elements of government uh, in order to change the culture uh, of government where that change is required in order to um, ameliorate the risk of what we would call corruption. Now Commissioner Lander has said that he, he didn't come to the role with preconceptions about the types or levels of corruption that might exist in South Australia, uh, but he did say that it would be extraordinary if South Australia was the only place you know, in the Commonwealth or indeed the world to be totally free of corruption. And I think that's, that's a very balanced and reasonable summary of what most of us in this room would expect uh, he would find. Uh, that said, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to say that silly suggestions about trivial matters being investigated by the Commission border on scaremongering and uh, local government in particular uh, should not become alarmed by hysterical suggestions and I'll, I'll leave it at that general level for the moment. Um, up to this point in time, the Commissioner uh, and his 10 Public of Integrity uh, Office staff are considering, I understand, over 150 complaints. Now that of course does not mean there will be 150 investigations uh, conducted uh, as a result of those complaints. And um, I can say, uh, without knowing anything about the complaints, I can say this, that it was my expectation that when uh, the Commission and the uh, OPI's doors opened that a, a number of regular customers 
would come out of the woodwork. Uh, people well known to most members of parliament, people probably well known to most local government people, people well known to the ombudsman, people well known to the police ombudsman, people who are, uh, for want of a better term, regulars. And uh, I, I think, although I don't know, there may be a few regulars within that 150. In any event, uh, the creation of ICAC and the Office of Public Integrity is actually vital for a modern and complex democracy. And it's an integral part of what we owe ourselves as a society. Its existence will serve as a deterrent uh, to ensure we maintain the fairness and freedom of previous generations have fought for and the right to openness, accountability and justice for South Australians. The ICAC's establishment, I believe and am confident, will bolster public confidence in our public institutions. It will also reflect positively on the offices of law enforcement in, in this state. And I mentioned, of course, SAPOL, uh, the DPP, uh, who will, of course, work collaboratively with the Commission to achieve those ends. Uh, I would also like to recognise uh, today the many parliamentary colleagues uh, who assisted uh, in enabling the establishment of um, uh, this office and um, uh, have assisted me and uh, the parliament in making sure that this actually came to be. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and pay uh, my uh, respects to the project group, which has worked for a good period of time to prepare for the establishment of the Commission and make sure that it was ready and open for business uh, on the 1st of September, as was um, uh, set down some time ago. And uh, I know all of those people worked very, very hard to achieve that, and uh, I say to them all, thank you very much. So for my part, I think this is a very exciting uh, change in the, uh, the public accountability structures here in South Australia. and. Uh, I believe absolutely that uh, with the establishment of the Commission and the appointment of the Commissioner at the beginning of September, that a new uh, era in public accountability here in South Australia has begun. But thank you very much. Well, it's my great pleasure now to um, introduce um, the next speaker, the, honor the honor Honourable uh, uh, Justice Bruce Lander, uh, the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption. Uh, Bruce Lander was previously a judge of the Federal Court of Australia, resident in Adelaide, was admitted as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of South Australia in March 1969. He practised as a solicitor until 1981 when he signed the bar role. In 19, 1986, he was appointed one of Her Majesty's counsel. In November 1994, he was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of South Australia. He remained a judge of that court until he was appointed a judge of the Federal Court of Australia on the 14th of July 2003. In January 2004, he was appointed an additional judge of the Supreme Court of the Australian Capital Territory, and in De December 2008, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Norfolk Island. In November 2005, he was appointed a Deputy President of the, Appeals, of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for a term of five years and was reappointed in 2010 for a further term. I also have it on good information that he is a keen gardener and even the lines on his lawn do not deviate. Bruce. When the Independent um, Commissioner Against Corruption Act was proclaimed to commence on the 1st of September, this year, it created two offices, the first being the Office for Public Integrity and the second being the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption. The offices are distinct but are designed in the Act to work harmoniously. They do so by giving responsibility for the Office for Public Integrity to the Commissioner. The two offices therefore are subject to the direction by the same person. I've appointed uh, Patricia Christie as Chief Executive Officer of both the Office for Public Integrity and the uh, Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, which means that she will have the managerial responsibility for the same two offices. She has been appointed as Chief Executive Officer of both offices in conformity uh, with the design of the Act. 
The independent commissioner has been given a number of functions. First, to identify and investigate corruption in public administration and refer that conduct for prosecution or refer that conduct to the South Australian Police or the Police Ombudsman for investigation and prosecution. Secondly, to assist inquiry agencies and public authorities to identify and deal with misconduct and maladministration in public administration. And that includes an educative function of which this is an instance. And thirdly, with further functions designed to assist with those two principal functions. The, commission does not, the Commissioner does not have a commission. The Act intends that the Commissioner will operate personally for the purpose of fulfilling the primary functions to which I've referred. The Office for Public Integrity was created with the functions of receiving and assessing complaints and reports about corruption, misconduct and maladministration in public administration from members of the public, inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers and making recommendations as to whether and by whom complaints and reports should be investigated. The Office for Public Integrity has other functions that are assigned to it by me. As I've said, the Office of Public in for Public Integrity is responsible to the Commissioner for the performance of its functions, but the Commissioner is not bound by the recommendations of the Office. The personnel in the office may be either public servants assigned to the office to assist the commissioner or employees of the commissioner assigned to the office by the commissioner. The Independent Commissioner Against Corruption Act has a curiosity that the commissioner can personally engage employees on terms and conditions determined by the commissioner. Those employees are not public servants but are public sector employees. The ICAC Act requires a system to be established for the receipt by OPI of complaints about public administration. In doing so, the Commissioner must, according to injunctions in the ICAC Act, prepare directions and guidelines governing reporting to OPI of matters that an inquiry agency, public authority or public officer reasonably suspects involves corruption, misconduct or maladministration in public administration. The directions and guidelines do not address the complaints of members of the public who are not members who are not public officers. I'll just now explain what those terms are. An inquiry agency is the Ombudsman, the Police Ombudsman and the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment. A public authority is defined in Schedule 1 of the ICAC Act to include the Governor, the members of the Crown, the Legislative Council, the House of Assembly, statutory authorities, public sector agencies, local government bodies, the Commissioner of Police and public authorities responsible for public officers. Public, a public officer is also defined in Schedule 1 and includes again the Governor, Ministers of the Crown, judicial officers, members of statutory authorities, all public sector employees, councillors and employees of local council, police officers and persons performing contract work for a public authority of the Crown. You can see therefore that um, the Act contemplates that some people might, might be both a public authority and a public officer. That is also especially designed to ensure the Act works um, comfortably. I've prepared directions and guidelines in, uh, con in, in, in accordance with the statutory obligation imposed upon me by the Act that govern reporting by inquiry agencies, public authorities, public officers, who become aware of conduct that they reasonably suspect constitutes uh, corruption, misconduct or maladministration. I've attempted in those um, directions and guidelines, uh, which, which are online and which have been published um, in booklet form, uh, to explain in section six of those directions and guidelines what is meant by the term reasonably suspects or forming a reasonable suspicion. Suspicion is a state of mind, but something less than belief. Those directions and guidelines specify the matters required to be reported and how they should be reported. They also specify the reporting of matters, even if those matters have been referred to an inquiry agency or another public authority. 
Those directions and guidelines are available on the ICAP website and at uh, uh, OP at 55 Curry Street, Adelaide. The Act requires all inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers to make reports to OP in accordance with those directions and guidelines. The OP therefore has been created as the shop front for the purpose of reporting corruption, misconduct or maladministration. The Act does not allow for complaints and reports to be made directly to me, but only to OP. There is one exception, the Attorney General is empowered to make reports directly to me. The directions and guidelines identify the matters which inquiry agencies, public authorities and public agencies must report to OP and those that they may report. The directions and guidelines also provide for the manner in which those reports should be made. The effect of the directions and guidelines is to make it, is to make it mandatory for inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers to report conduct that, that those bodies or persons reasonably suspect involves corruption. So all matters in, which is suspected by a public officer or a public authority or an inquiry agent to, be, to uh, be conduct that amounts to corruption must be reported to OP. If a public uh, uh, officer failed to report a matter that he, re he or she reasonably suspected amounted to corruption, that public officer would be liable to be f liable for misconduct. The direction of guidelines also oblige inquiry agencies to report serious or systemic misconduct or maladministration to OP. Public authorities and public officers must also report serious or systemic maladministration uh, to OP unless the public authority or the public officer knows that the matter has already been reported to an inquiry agency. The intent of the directions and guidelines, which I say I had to publish under the injunction contained in the Act, is to ensure that all conduct that anyone in public administration reasonably suspects involves corruption is reported to OP. The further intent of the directions and guidelines is that all conduct that anyone in public administration reasonably suspects involves misconduct or maladministration is reported either directly to OP or indirectly to OP through an inquiry agency. The end result should be that if inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers comply with the directions and guidelines, OP should be made aware of all conduct that anyone in public administration reasonably suspects to be co corruption or serious and systemic maladministration in public administration in the state. Because the Act applies at both state government and local government level, if the direction and, and guidelines are observed by those who have to observe them, OP should be the repository of all reports of all conduct that is reasonably suspected to be corruption, misconduct and maladministration. I should say the obligation to report also includes the obligation to self-report. If a public authority reasonably suspects that it or someone has engaged in corruption or misconduct or maladministration within its own organisation, which, is, which in the case of misconduct and maladministration is serious or systemic, the public authority must report that conduct to OP. Inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers are obliged to make their reports online. The report must contain the information contained in the direction and guidelines, which is also available online. The purpose of the direction and guidelines is to have the inquiry agency, public authority or public officer identify precisely the issue that the inquiry agency, public authority or public officer reasonably suspects involves corruption or serious or systemic mal uh, misconduct or maladministration and to provide the evidence which is known to the body or the person reporting that has given rise to the suspicion. The inquiry agency, public authority or public officer can seek OPs or the Commissioner's permission to, re to receive a report other than online, but the intent of the directions and guidelines is that those bodies and persons will report online. There is no obligation on members of the public who are not public officers to report their suspicions of conduct or serious or, or systemic misconduct or maladministration. However, the Act does suppose that members of the public will make complaints and all members of the public 
who entertain a suspicion of the kind to which I've referred are encouraged to report that conduct to OPIE by correspondence, telephone or in person. There can be no doubt that there are a number of members of the public um, who will entertain those suspicions because in, in a number of cases they believe that they have been the victims of corruption, misconduct or maladministration. Uh, some of those people have already approached the office as the um, Deputy Premier um, contemplated they would. Um, some of those people I've seen in my previous life as a judge and some of those, some of those people are, are well known publicly. Um, those, th th those types of people um, uh, are reporting conduct which has become an obsession with them. So whilst uh, we've received more than 150 complaints or already, uh, you, you ought not to think we've re received 150 complaints that require serious investigation. You ought not to, re to think that we've received 150 complaints of corruption. Um, we've received some serious complaints, but um, far less than the 150 to which uh, uh, the Deputy Premier referred. The directions and guidelines, uh, directions and guidelines only require inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers to report conduct that has occurred after the 1st of September 2013. The reason that the obligation to report is limited to conduct after the 1st of September 2013 is a practical one. If the directions and guidelines required an inquiry agency, public authority or public officer to report any impugned conduct that occurred before 1st of September 2013, there'd simply be no limit to their obligations. Those subject to mandatory reporting obligations would have to address conduct that might have occurred 30 or 40 years ago and would have no relevance uh, today. For that reason, I limited the mandatory obligations for reporting conduct of the kind to which I've referred to conduct after the 1st of September 2013. However, that does not mean that those people cannot report conduct which has occurred prior to that date. Um, if um, any of the any inquiry agency, public authority or public officers considers that um, they reasonably suspect conduct of the kind to which I've referred should be reported, uh, and that conduct occurred prior to the 1st of September, they are at liberty to make that report. Indeed, um, of all the um, complaints that we've, we've so far received, the conduct complained of occurred prior to the 1st of September. That, of course, is unsurprising, having regard to the fact that the Act only commenced on the 1st of September. Uh, we look forward to receiving the, the other complaints later. The receipt of complaints and reports uh, relating to conduct before 1 September 2013 is consistent with the Act which permits investigations into conduct that occurred prior to the commencement of the Act. A closer reading of the directions and guidelines will reveal that the directions and guidelines do not apply to some public authorities and public officers where those authorities or um, officers have learnt of conduct only by reason of the discharge of their duties. For example, the Director of Public Prosecutions does not have to report conduct that he reasonably suspects might be corruption, misconduct or maladministration, where he's learnt of that conduct only because he is prosecuting someone in relation to that conduct. If the direction of guidelines had been otherwise complied with, OPI would have been already advised of that conduct. Can I just quickly address what does amount to corruption, misconduct or maladministration? Corruption is conduct that amounts to a criminal offence of a kind described in Section 5 of the Act and includes offences such as bribery or corruption of public officers, threats or reprisals against public officers, abuse of public office, demanding or requiring benefits on the basis of public office, offences relating to appointment to a public office, offences under the Public um, Honesty and Accountability Act, and any other offence committed by a public officer while acting in the public officer's capacity as a public officer. It's important to note that the Act does not create an offence of corruption. The Act does not create any new offences at all. What it does is generically describe existing offences, offences that existed prior to the 1st of September as corruption. And that um, takes up the point the Deputy Premier made um, in, his, uh, in his remarks. 
The Act is not intending to prescribe conduct as corruption that wasn't corruption before the Act came into, into play. The Act is simply describing existing offences as corruption. So what was inappropriate conduct prior to the commencement of the Act is still inappropriate conduct. But what was appropriate conduct before the commencement of the Act remains appropriate conduct, at least in so far as corruption is concerned. And, and I'll come to this a little, a little more detail later, we ought not to be, we ought not to overreact uh, to uh, my appointment or to the commencement of this Act. The purpose of the Act is to provide a place where and a focus for complaints. The Act does not create any new offences. The definition of corruption is very wide because it includes, as I, I mentioned a short, a short time ago, any offence committed by a public um, officer in the discharge of the public service uh, officer's duties. That means whatever offence a public officer committed during the public officer's exercise of the public officer's duties will amount to corruption. For example, if a public officer was driving a motor vehicle in the discharge of the public officer's duties and committed a speeding offence, that offence would, because of the de definition in corru of corruption in the Act, become corruption. I've taken the view that uh, the Office for Public Integrity and I were not established to inquire into offences under the Road Traffic Act, and the directions and guidelines specifically state that an inquiry agency public authority or public officer need not report such conduct. I recently addressed um, uh, members of the um, AWU, um, um, who have a number of members themselves of uh, local council. Uh, during um, the address, I was asked a question by um, uh, one of the delegates, who asked me um, whether um, I would prosecute him if he accepted a cup of coffee from um, a ratepayer. Well, first I tried to explain that I don't prosecute anyone. I'm just an investigator, as the Deputy Premier said. But secondly, I answered him this way. I said, um, up until um, a week ago, um, I was a judge of the Federal Court of Australia, which was a, a very important job and involved uh, very important responsibilities. I told him I hadn't resigned to investigate whether he had sugar in his coffee or not. And that, I think, is an instance of where there has been an overreaction to uh, my appointment. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in that sort of conduct. I won't be interested in that sort of conduct. I'm in, interested in conduct that amounts to corruption, to criminal offences, or I'm interested in sy serious or st systemic misconduct or maladministration. Misconduct means contravention of a code of conduct by a public officer in the discharge of the public officer's duties that might constitute a ground for disciplinary action against the officer or some other misconduct. The reporting obligations only require the reporting of serious or systemic misconduct. I've taken the view that less serious or single acts of misconduct by a public officer should be dealt with in accordance with the ordinary disciplinary procedures in the public authority to which the public officer is attached or by the ombudsman or police ombudsman. Therefore, I've taken the view again that uh, OPI should only receive complaints of serious or systemic misconduct, other matters of misconduct which are, which are less serious or, as I said, one-off uh, acts should remain as disciplinary matters in the uh, public authority. Maladministration means conduct of the public officer or a practice policy or procedure of a public authority that results in an, in an irregular use of public money or involves substantial misconduct of public resources and includes conduct resulting from impropriety, incompetence or negligence. Again, the reporting obligations only require the reporting of serious or systemic maladministration. Once a complaint or report is made, uh, the Act requires OP to assess the complaint or report to determine whether it raises potential issues of corruption in public administration that could be the subject of uh, prosecution or raises potential issues of misconduct or maladministration, which is serious or systemic, or raises some other issues that should be referred to an inquiry agency. Or on the other hand, is a complaint or report that is trivial, 
vexatious or frivolous, or has previously been dealt with by public administration or authority, and there is no reason to examine it, or there is a other good reason as to why no action should be taken in respect of the complaint or report. I've asked uh, my officers uh, within uh, the Office for Public Integrity to be alert to uh, complaints which are uh, trivial, vexatious or frivolous, or which have been previously examined in detail by, for example, the Ombudsman or the Police Ombudsman. Uh, it's not my intention to um, embark on any sort of investigation of any matter that appears to be trivial or vexatious. And I've asked uh, my officers to ensure that uh, when they make their recommendations to me, they uh, appropriately assess those um, complaints which ought not to be further inquired into. The OP must make recommendations to the Commissioner. Once the OP has made an assessment of the complaint or report and made a recommendation to me, uh, my obligations in relation to the Act are engaged. Uh, however, I'm not bound by any recommendation made to me by the uh, by OP. I can assess for myself uh, how the complaint should be dealt with, or the complaint or report should be dealt with, and uh, I can uh, as well, um, on my own initiative, um, inquire into matters which have not been formally complained of. If a matter is assessed as raising a potential issue of corruption, the matter must be investigated by me or referred to uh, SAPOL or the police ombudsman if it concern, concerns a police officer or to uh, some other law enforcement agency. The ICAC Act does not specifically empower OP to carry out any investigations at all, but I've taken the view that OP should uh, carry out or should make proper inquiries so that it can make an informed recommendation to me. By that I mean that it, OP may have to make inquiries outside the very complaint that's been given to it to determine whether the matter is frivolous or vexatious or trivial or it, it requires investigation. So I've instructed those uh, officers within OP that they should make preliminary inquiries, not an investigation, but pre preliminary inquiries into any, any complaint or report that is made. Uh, a law enforcement agency to which corruption um, allegations can be referred include the, the Australian Crime Commission, the Australian Federal Police, SAPOL, the Police Ombudsman um, or another Australian Police Force or the ICAC's equivalents in the other states. I should say this and I've said it publicly before, if a matter is adjudged um, as uh, a potential issue in relation to corruption, I'll investigate the matter for myself. I'm not intending at this stage to delegate any of those matters to any other law enforcement agency. It might be in the immediate future that um, some matters of corruption will continue to be investigated by SAPOL, which have already been investigated by the anti-corruption branch within SAPOL. But in due course, it is my intention, because I think it's the perception that's in the Act, that I should investigate those for myself. I'm obliged, um, if a matter is identified um, as giving rise to serious or systemic uh, misconduct or maladministration to either um, refer the matter to the Ombudsman or Police Ombudsman, depending upon what jurisdiction is involved, or alternatively to the public authority in which the public officer, in the case of misconduct, uh, is employed, or in the case of maladministration is involved. Um, I'm confident that a number of the complaints that are made to me will be referred to the Ombudsman and to the Police Ombudsman for further investigation. I'm also confident that there'll be some matters where it would be appropriate to refer the matter to the public authority if the public authority has not previously had an opportunity of examining the, the claims of misconduct or maladministration. However, in all cases, the referrals to those bodies will carry with it an obligation to report back to me uh, as to the findings made and uh, the action taken. The main focus of my investigations will be corruption. Can I say something quickly about the investigation process? The, in the investigation process um, requires, in relation to corruption, requires me to um, take responsibility for the investigation. It requires me to appoint someone to head up the investigation. I will either head up the investigation or uh, Mrs Christie will be appointed. 
we have um, recruited two police officers um, to um, head up the investigation team. Detective Superintendent Moyle has been seconded to the uh, to uh, the independent commissioner as director of operations for a period of three years. The appointment of police officers um, to ICAC is uh, contemplated in the Act. Section 14 specifically contemplates that uh, police officers will be seconded to ICAC. A manager of operations who is also uh, a police officer who's been seconded to ICAC has also been appointed. Other investigators will be appointed between, the now, between now and the end of October, and, and I think it be the case that by the end of October, there'll be eight investigators uh, within ICAC. I have got power under the ICAC Act to issue a warrant to um, allow an investigator uh, to enter a, and search a place occupied by a public authority. However, I do not have power to um, issue a warrant to allow an investigator to enter on, on pr private uh, premises. If I want to give that power to an investigator, or if an investigator wants that power, the investigator must apply to the um, Supreme Court for that warrant. I know from my experience when I was a judge that applications for warrants can take a little time, sometimes a couple of days, and that sometimes can impede an investigation. South Australian police officers have what's called a general warrant, which is given to them under section 67 of the Summary Offences Act. That uh, general warrant can continue with a, a SAPOL officer where that, when that officer is seconded to another organisation if the Commissioner of Police agrees. The Commissioner of Police has agreed that uh, he will continue to allow SAPOL officers who are seconded to ICAC to exercise their general search warrant. That means that those officers who are then investigators of ICAC do not have to apply to the Supreme Court for a warrant. Now, this is not a, a, a circumvention of the Act. The second reading speech envisaged police officers would use their general search warrant when um, uh, seconded to uh, ICAT. If um, I'm investigating any matter, I can require by notice and writing a South Australian Law Enforcement Agency or an inquiry agency or public authority to refrain from taking any action. That allows me therefore to require any other law enforcement agency, which I've previously identified, any inquiry agency or any public authority to desist from taking or making any further investigation into a complaint until I've had a chance of examining for myself. And that is a power I'll exercise when appropriate. Can I mention very quickly examinations? The, you will all understand that I've been given very extensive coercive powers, uh, similar powers that are given to the Australian Crime Commission. And I'm empowered to conduct examinations, but only in private, as the Deputy Premier said. The purpose of an examination is to obtain additional information to that which can be obtained by the ordinary investigative process. The examiner, and there are only two of us, again it's uh, me and Mrs Christie, uh, will determine how the hearing takes place. There are no rules of evidence. An examination is not a trial, of course. As the Deputy Premier says, I, don't, I, I no longer exercise any judicial power. I no longer have, I, I, I do not have any prosecutorial authority. I am simply an investigator. There is no finding of, of guilt in relation to any examination, either before or after the investigation completes. Examinations have to be uh, um, conducted in accordance with Schedule 2 to the Act. They must be com um, uh, conducted in private. I can summons a person to give evidence uh, at that hearing. Uh, you, can con you can understand that it's not any persons whose conduct is being inquired into who may be summons uh, to give evidence at a hearing. Uh, the, police, the police often, in their ordinary investigative process, have difficulty obtaining evidence from um, witnesses. 
because those witness are par witnesses may be partial to the um, person who is being uh, investigated. Uh, this power will be used to have those witnesses give evidence that they would otherwise not give. If um, a person is served with a summons, that person must not disclose that he or she has received the summons or notice, except insofar as a person discloses it to his or her legal practitioner or to any other purpose for the pur purpose of uh, uh, ensuring compliance with the summons. It is an offence for a person not to comply with a summons. The examinee may be represented by a legal practitioner. The commissioner or the examiner may direct that any evidence or the contents of a document not be published. It is an offence for a witness at an examination when required to refuse to take an oath or an affirmation or to refuse to answer a question that the commissioner or examiner requires that person to answer or refuse to fail to produce a document that the person was required to produce. If a legal practitioner is summoned, and they may be, to appear to give evidence themselves or produce a document, the legal practitioner is entitled to refuse to answer a question or produce a document if in doing so he or she would disclose a uh, privileged communication between the lawyer and the lawyer's client, unless the client, of course, waives a privilege. However, if privilege is not waived, the legal practitioner must tell the commissioner or examiner the name and address of the person to whom or by whom the communication was made. That allows then the investigators to go to those other persons for the purpose of obtaining the evidence that the legal practitioner refuses to give by reason of the privilege. Importantly, the Act provides that if a witness is asked a question or is required to produce a document, and before answering the question or producing the document, claims that the answer or production might tend to incriminate the person, the answer or the document produced is not admissible in evidence against a person in a criminal proceeding or a proceeding for the imposition of a penalty, save a proceeding under the Criminal Assets Compensation Act or a proceeding under the ICAC Act for falsely answering a question or falsely making a statement. That, that, that is an important matter. It means that I will hear evidence that if that person is subsequently prosecuted, a jury will never hear. The purpose of giving me that power is to assist in investigations so that um, if I'm aware of the evidence given by the person under coercion, I can have my investigators make other investigators to obtain evidence that will be admissible at that person's trial. As I said earlier, my role is to investigate corruption and ascertain whether there is sufficient evidence to refer the matter to the Director of Public Prosecutions. I don't, as I've said twice and I'll say it again, I don't carry out any judicial function or prosecutorial function. Investigators, as the Deputy Premier previously said, do not carry out their investigations of criminal conduct in public. The time for a public hearing in the ordinary course of an investigation is after a person is charged and at that person's trial. At that stage, it would have been decided that there is a case to answer and that the person should be put on his or her trial. For that reason alone, it would be appropriate to hold the hearings in private because the hearings are merely for the purpose of obtaining evidence. However, in my opinion, there are other reasons. First, evidence obtained during examination may provide new, ave new avenues of inquiry to the investigators. If that information is communicated more broadly, it may hinder the ability of investigators to follow up those lines and obtain that evidence. Secondly, a private hearing means that evidence that will not be admissible in a trial will not become public. A hearing in private avoids that risk if there is a later prosecution of the accused arguing that, due to the adverse publicity surrounding the examination and the publication of evidence given, the accused cannot receive a fair trial and for that reason the prosecution should not be allowed to go forward. That would be an extraordinarily unfortunate result. Thirdly, it meets one of the, it meets one of the primary objectives of the Act, which is to achieve a balance between the public interest in exposing corruption while avoiding undue per, uh, prejudice to a person's reputation. 
irremedial reputational damage can be caused by allegations that are not in due course capable of being established. At the end of the hearing and at the end of the investigation, there will be either evidence sufficient to put the, the person whose conduct is under examination on trial or not. But it will only be the evidence admissible at trial that, we, that will be considered before sending the matter to the DPP to prosecute. If there is such evidence, the evidence will be adduced in public at the person's trial and the public will have the opportunity of judging the conduct of the person accused for itself. If there is not sufficient evidence to put the person on trial, the person will not have suffered the reputational damage that would have be occasioned by a public hearing. In my view, public examination should not be used to shame a person where there is insufficient evidence to charge that person with a criminal offence. I want to uh, address very quickly uh, concepts of privacy. The scheme of the Act is to keep all complaints, reports, assessments, investigations, referrals or evaluations under the Act confidential. Indeed, the uh, Act requires me and my staff not to disclose information obtained in the course of the administration of the Act, except for the purposes of the administration or the enforcement of the Act, or generally for the performance of the functions of the Act. However, I can authorise, where appropriate, the provision of information to the persons mentioned in the Act. <clears throat> Generally, that authority is restricted to providing information to a complainant or a, or a reporter, or a person who is the subject of a complaint or report, or those agencies that would have an interest in including an inquiry agency, public authority, law enforcement agency, a minister or the Auditor General. The authority should only be used by me for the purpose where the provision of information will assist in the prevention or commission of an offence involving corruption. <clears throat> if I authorise the provision of such information to any person, the person who receives that information must keep the inf information confidential. The Act therefore imposes a very tight rein upon me and my officers in the provision of, in relation to information. However, I am given the power to make a public statement in, con in connection with uh, a matter if I think it to be in the public interest. In assessing public interest, I must have regard to the benefits to any investigation, the risk of prejudicing a person by making the statement, whether the statement is necessary to ally uh, public concern or prevent or minimise the risk or prejudice to the reputation of a person, whether such a statement would redress prejudice caused by a person's, uh, to a person's reputation, as a result of an allegation made against that person being public, or the risk of adversely affecting potential prosecution. There will be occasions where I will need to make public statements and I'll make them. It's not only me and my staff, however, that must keep matters confidential. It is an offence under the Act for a person to publish or cause to be published information that tends to suggest someone is or may have been the subject of a complaint or report or information that might enable that person to be identified, or the fact a person has made or is about to make a complaint or report, or information that might identify a complainant or report it, or the fact a person has given or is about to give information under the Act. The penalty for breach of this pr provision in the case of a natural person is $30,000. Publish has a very wide definition in the Act, and um, it might be construed that Pub publish or publication includes speaking to someone in private. If that cons construction is correct, that could lead to most unfortunate consequences. For example, if a public officer were to disclose to a uh, chief executive officer of a public authority that he or she was aware of conduct that potentially raised the issue of cor corruption, neither of the persons of the conversation, being the CEO or the public officer, could tell each other that they intended to report the matter to ICAC or that they had reported the matter to ICAC. Moreover, an inquiry could, agency could not tell a complainant to the inquiry agency that the inquiry agency had sent the matter to ICAC. That would leave complainants completely uninformed as to whether a complaint had been made to, um, I should have said OP, not ICAC, uh, whether a complaint had been made to OP or the res result of the complaint. That seems to be a most unfortunate result. The Act, however, does allow me to give authority for persons to publish information. The directions and guidelines uh, to which I've already referred contains a section which is designed to inform persons how they may approach OP or indeed me in that case, 
to obtain my authority to provide information which is necessary to be provided to another party so as to keep the process with an OP and ICAC transparent. Independence. The Act provides for an independent commissioner. The commissioner cannot, under the scheme of things, be entirely independent of government. The budget does not allow that to be, and I don't think the budget should allow it to be. The, off, the um, OP and I will have to use government departments. For example, um, the Attorney General's department will assist in pays and will assist in procurements and human resources. Relying upon government agents, other government agencies, however, does not, in my opinion, opinion affect my independence. There may be occasions from time to time when I have to use the services of SAPOL, and I'll do so if I think it necessary. The, um, the office has not been uh, resourced sufficiently to uh, have a covert intelligence uh, team or to have a full-scale uh, telephone intercept uh, unit. And for those reasons, um, uh, SAPOL, we will have to rely upon, rely upon SAPOL for the provision of uh, those uh, um, resources. But again, that, it seems to me, does not uh, impinge upon the independence of my office. It seems to me that I have the responsibility of persuading the public that I am independent. I accept that responsibility uh, for ensuring in reality and, per and perception that the Commissioner is independent. I will accept no direction from government or any arm of government, although I must say I have no reason to expect that I would receive any such direction. Lastly, can I say this, and I've alluded to it already, I've noticed in previous speaking engagements that some public authorities, including local councils, have become concerned about the powers I've been given and the exercise of those powers. I cannot express too strongly that insofar as corruption is concerned, the criminal offences that constitute that description have not changed as a result of the Act. What was a criminal offence before this Act came into operation is still an offence. Conduct that did not constitute an offence before this Act came into offence will not be corruption as a consequence of the Act. <coughs> Pardon me. The same is true of misconduct and maladministration. Conduct that was not misconduct or maladministration before the Act commenced will not become misconduct or maladministration because of the Act. I think some legal practitioners have become perhaps too have taken perhaps too cautious a view and have given advice that is perhaps an overreaction to the purposes and functions of the Act. The Act is concerned with conduct. It requires all of us to act ethically. If that is how we've been acting, there's no reason to change. Thank you very much.